from here on out there to you. We, t- we decided we probably should wear masks while we're singing because we're not sure who was going to be here. And, um, and so thank you for coming and thank you for all of uh, you who are joining us online. And we certainly appreciate your caution and your prayers. It's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? When you, you know, it just feels like you're starting to get some momentum and then we have to sort of back up again. But um, you know, the Bible tells us to rejoice in the Lord always and to not grow well and or weary in well-doing, and so we're going to stay the course. And in, for all of you who were watching us on Facebook, there is actually a spirit of joy, and, and um, we, we worship God in a lively and robust way, even though we couldn't all gather uh, as, as we would like to. So, But we're getting there, and I am going to pray for... Um, I want to pray for our community, for our nation, that this, this thing slows down and we can uh, get back to life as normal. So let's, let's take just a moment and pray together, y'all. God, thank you for um, worship, and thank you that even though we're, we're disconnected in proximity, we need to be able to do what we can to, uh, to meet, encourage, and gather. Still, Lord, we recognize that you are still amongst us and still here in power and strength. Every time I drive into this um, this parking lot, I, I pray that you would fill us with your power and with your presence and with your people. And so it's, it's strange to know how to um, navigate these times, but still we know that the people of God are gathered by your name and we're called according to your purposes and we can trust that. So I pray for your encouragement to each person here. We pray for um, safety, Lord, for our community. The Quad Cities is one of the hot spots in, in all of the country for uh, COVID-19 and we know now that uh, you know, hospitals are, are getting full, our, our health care workers are being overpressed, and we pray for their strength. We know that uh, uh, there's just a lot of need right now, and sort of the, the um, I don't know, the, the, the time that we were all praying that we would know when it's really time to, to sort of step back, and we know that time is here, and we need to be very cautious. So I pray for your encouragement, I pray for young families that are struggling to know how to bring their children into a, a, home, a homeschool environment at the same time they have to work and they have to shop and so many different things. Help us, as Joya said, help us to be people that help and encourage and, and are quick to see need where it, uh, where it comes up. So, Lord, we pray for your strength and for your encouragement uh, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Uh, as you know, we've sort of started a series um, kind of based on things that Cross Point Church was founded on. So we're kind of rebooting some messages that were really important to us in those beginning years. And as so many of us are new, so many of us uh, online with us are new. And so some of these things are just have kind of become embedded into who we are as God's people. And yet sometimes if we're not reminded of them, it's easy to, uh, to forget. So we're going to look at uh, John 8, if you have your Bibles, um, to see if we can see how, how do we see people through the lens that Jesus sees people. It's really difficult for us, and we can't do it without him, but this is a passage of Scripture that reminds us who we are to be as the people of God. It, it's, a, it's, it's one of the more hotly debated passages because most scholars, in fact, all modern scholars that I'm aware of, recognize that these words pro- were not written by John. Um, and so, as you know, the Bible is written by, by people as they're inspired by God to, to write uh, his word to mankind, his letter to mankind. So John was one of the disciples, and, and he wrote uh, the gospel according to John. He's one of the, the, the evangelists, the four evangelists. And then he also wrote um, uh, uh, first and second and third John in Revelation. And so, but this particular passage wasn't written by John. We don't know who it was written by. And in fact, it doesn't even show up in our Greek text. So you, you, you know that the, the, uh, the, Old Te- the New Testament rather is written in Greek. And so it doesn't even show up in the Greek text until the 9th century. It shows up in the Latin text. The Latin texts were based on translations from the Hebrew text. And so there's, there's sort of this, this line that sort of is, is, uh, is, is sometimes debated as to which you know, versions we should be looking at. It basically all says the same thing, but it doesn't even show up in the Latin text until the 4th century, and largely that was because people often saw women as the reason that men failed sexually. They were seducing or they were at somehow fault. It's an idea that continues sometimes and in some places, unfortunately, in our world today. So this, this text is, is sort of debated 
Um, it shows up at times in Luke. In some of our translation, it shows up in Luke. Uh, it shows up in different places in John. But over the years, it's been sort of recognized that this is where we're going to put it. In between uh, chapter 7 and, uh, verse, and chapter 8, verse 12. And even if you just read it, and you can kind of go back and do this. And if you read ver- uh, chapter 7 into through 8, you'll see that it just doesn't quite fit. It's, it, there's this movement of stories. There's a dispute over who Jesus is. Jesus is, and he's teaching on the Feast of Tabernacles, and there's, there's these things that are happening, and then all of a sudden it kind of goes to this story. The language is di- different. It's the different kind of language than John uses. But here's what has become consensus down through the years. This reflects a story that was very likely, in fact, in the, even the first century, that was told. So it's, it's more of an anecdotal story that at least we can say reflects the character and the teaching of Jesus But I personally believe it's something that somehow divinely has been preserved so that we could then see it as uh, something that God preserved for our benefit. So that's where many of us kind of fall on it. No, it wasn't written by John, but it still is something that we need to recognize uh, in a really palpable way shows the character and the nature of Jesus and something that we need to remind ourselves of. So uh, having said that, we're just going to kind of look at this story, and a lot of you already know uh, what, it, what, it, what it says, and so let's just review. We'll start at verse 2. It says, at the dawn he appeared, that is Jesus, again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. So what Jesus would do, particularly during these feast days, is he would come in and he would teach, and then he'd go up uh, out, kind of outside of town to Mount of Olives where he had friends that lived near there in Bethany, and then he'd come back and he'd teach. So this is sort of his normal process when he's in Jerusalem, uh, particularly during the feast days. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? Um, So you can see the picture now. He's sitting there. He's teaching to a group of people. Uh, The Pharisees and the scribes, or the the, the teachers of the law, they sort of work together. The teachers of the law, the scribes, they would be the ones that would know how to interpret. They would understand God's. They were were experts in God's law. The Pharisees were the ones that that usually implemented it, made sure that it was carried out. So they were sort of the keepers of, uh, together, they sort of were the keepers of the law in, um, in Jerusalem at the time. So they bring this unfortunate woman and they say uh, she's been caught in adultery. Now there's, there's and that the law of Moses um, uh, required that she were to be stoned. Now the law of Moses, as you know, was given to the people of Israel 1,500 years before this particular story. And kind of throughout that time, it had gone through a lot of sort of um, uh, rabbinical uh, 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 evolution. It, there's been things that had changed and been added so that you could keep the law. And sometimes it was really oppressive. So you remember Jesus made uh, Jesus made uh, comments about you know gathering food on the on the Sabbath day. You remember some of those little nitpicky things that the Pharisees would get him on. And he says, "Look, your 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 tithing of the spices in your rack. Imagine taking ten percent of your spices. Your your tithing of that, but you're missing." The, the importance and the weightiness of the law, the greater things. So this is what happened. They took the law of Moses and they just really made it complicated and overbearing, frankly. So there's a time where Jesus says, uh, listen to my words, take on my yoke, it's light. Uh, in contrast to the words and the yoke of the Pharisees, which was heavy. So this is what they're doing. So over the years, what had happened was this law, according to Moses, had some additions to it. So if you were to actually... You had to actually catch somebody in the act of any sort of sin, and then it was defined. So in other words, according to the, the laws of Moses, you had to be, there had to be two or three witnesses. So if you were caught, if, if an accusation was brought against you, particularly one that carried the death penalty, you had to have two witnesses. So then they had, they had to make, the, how do you witness two people committing adultery unless you just sort of barge in on them? So they actually had laws that said you had to see them in a sexual context, and they even added making the, the appropriate movements, or in other words, the movements had to be sexual movements. So in other words, you, if you were going to catch somebody in adultery, you literally had to set them up. I mean, it was li- you literally had to sort of say, well, we think they're committing adultery, and then two people had to sort of wait, and then they had to sort of, ah, and then they caught them. 
So this is what the law had evolved to. So the very fact that they had to go through, if in fact they went through that process of two of them, two or more of them actually seeing the man and the woman in the act of adultery, which they may not have done, but if they did do that, then they're trying to catch this man and this woman in an, in an act. Now, the other thing that's wrong with this is the man's not there. So you were supposed to, to kill both the man and the woman. So this, is, so this is an austere law. This is hard for us to get. And gratefully, Jesus said he fulfills those laws. So we're not bound by these laws uh, today. But still, even at that time, you can imagine it'd be difficult for, for a person to actually be caught in adultery, you'd have to be pretty brazen about it. But then if you were, you took the man and the woman, and if the, if, if the woman was married, then she was strangled, and if she was uh, engaged, she would be stoned. So engagement carried a lot of weight. So this is a big thing, right? Um, on top of that, there was a law that also said if someone was about to commit a crime or a sin, you had an obligation to prevent them from doing it. So then there'd be no way for you to sort of, you know, catch somebody in the act of adultery when what you should have been doing was trying to prevent them from doing it in the first place. So then you had culpability too. You were breaking the law in doing this. And so then to make matters worse, worse the guy's not there. So then, so you have a bunch of things that are going wrong. It's, it's basically entrapment. Um, they, they didn't do anything to prevent the, the adultery from happening, and then there was a misapplication or a, uh, a, 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 of, of the carry out of justice. It was disproportionate. The man, so there, I'm assuming, you can only assume that either the story's not true, which as we're going to find out from Jesus' response, that it was true. So in order for it to be true, they had to catch them in the act. And so then, then the only conclusion you can make is that they're dispensing justice in, inequitably. In other words, they're treating the woman very differently than they do the man. The man's not there. He's probably being protected. This is some of the challenges of our own culture, what a lot of us believe that, that the, the, uh, the, the, the prosecution of justice is not being equally dispensed, that there are some people groups that experience it differently than others. And so this is what's happening for sure in this culture. Women were simply treated differently than men. And it's not fair, and it wasn't a, a, an equitable uh, dispensing of justice. So, there's, so this, whole, this whole scenario is filled with problems, isn't it? So, um, and now we know why, it, why it's done in the first place. It says they were using this question as a trap in order to have the basis for accusing him. So in other words, here's this guy, this guy named Jesus. He's walking around. He's telling everybody. Um, he's saying, you know, take... Take the log out of your eye before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Don't, you know, don't judge unless you want to be judged. Um, uh, you know, uh, do unto others as you would have done to them. Here's this guy talking of love. You're going to know that they're my, my uh, followers because they love one another, this type of thing. But now he's in front of people and the Pharisees are saying, well, what about her? So if he's going to prosecute according to the law of Moses, he would have to sort of say, yeah, she should be stoned. Then he's not quite the, the, uh, the, the guy, the savior, the Messiah. Everybody was sort of starting to believe that he was, was he? Because he just now, you can imagine the brutal nature of an execution like that in front of a whole crowd. So what these Pharisees are looking for is a public execution with Jesus condoning of it. So he's either going to be someone who condones this murder or he's going to be somebody who completely ignores the law of Moses. So they think they've got him. Uh, it's just tragic. They have, the, the Pharisees and the scribes have no regard for this poor woman's life, do they? So Jesus bends down and he started to write. Uh, started to write on the ground with his fingers. So you can, I mean, you get the message. He's going to say, oh, okay. And then he just sort of kneels down and starts to write with his finger. Now they continue to talk to him. They're saying, when they kept on questioning him, I can just hear him like, hey, so uh, what you writing down there, buddy? Come on, you got to give us an answer. What are you talking, what's, what's your solution here of this dilemma? He says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, let any of one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Because in the law of Moses, again, if someone successfully brought an accusation, particularly one that carried a death penalty, it was them that had to throw the first stone. 
So if you brought an accusation like this of a woman and a man caught in adultery and it was verified by two witnesses that saw them, then the one making the accusation, which would be presumably the people that caught them, would then have to throw the first stone. So it carried a lot of weight to make these accusations like this. So Jesus, now you can see Jesus, he's understanding the whole situation. He goes, hey, you don't have any sin? Start chucking, buddy. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. We'll talk about what this created in the minds of the Pharisees, but obviously this had a lot of weight. He says, at this, those who heard began to go away at one time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So you get the picture. He, he writes on the ground. He says, whoever, you know, is without sin, start chucking. He goes back to writing, you know, the... Pharisees and the scribes are sort of standing there, and then the older ones begin to leave, and the youngers, and then eventually the, the whole crowd disperses. Jesus straightened up. Woman, where are they? Woman in that culture would be a term of endearment. It's not exactly uh, guys in, in here who are married. If you say, woman, go make me a sandwich, you're probably going to get in a whole lot of trouble, so probably not wise to do that. But in that culture, it would be a term of endearment. Jesus used the term woman for his own uh, mother. She says, uh, he says, who has condemned you? Uh, no one, sir, she said, uh, indicating her respect for him. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. And because he's acknowledging leave your life of sin, we can only extrapolate that she actually was having an adulterous affair um, uh, with a man. So now, the, the story is compelling, which is why we've been telling it all of these years. And at first blush, it, it doesn't need a lot of explanation. It doesn't need a lot of exegetical or theological work. It's, it's basically, look, if you you know, examine yourself before you begin, you know, judging and accusing others. And um, just don't be judgmental. It's consistent with the, the work and the words of Jesus. But when you sort of dig into the story as we have a little bit, you find out that there's more complexity to it, isn't there? Because we can't just ignore sin. We can't just ignore law, do we? Um, and it, it does begin, become more challenging. Even in that culture, it had, as I've said, it had a lot of these sort of challenges. It was the law, and she did do it, and they don't have the guy, and they didn't bring a legitimate uh, uh, accusation, and there's all kinds of problems here in this whole scenario. But what is interesting is Jesus addresses everyone in exactly the same way. So in other words, he tells the, the poor, unfortunate woman, well, all right, stop doing it. All right? I'm not condemning you. Just stop doing it. We don't know what she did. We don't know how she left. There are stories in the Bible where people who were forgiven of sins were, were weeping and very moved, and they were, they were you know, the story of, of, of the woman who, who, who anointed Jesus, washed his feet with her tears and anointed with oil and washed it with, his, with her hair. There were some people who were very, we have no idea what this woman did. Presumably, she left her life of sin. I think when Jesus says, stop doing something, you probably should stop doing it. Maybe she did. I hope she did. We don't know. But what's interesting is he does the same thing with all these Pharisees and scribes. He could have got into a big argument with him, couldn't he? Have? And sometimes Jesus did. He could say, well, first of all, you know, as you've already mentioned, first of all, um, this isn't legitimate because the man's not here. Second of all, if, if, um, if you're to act on this and you believe this is true, you should have stopped her in the first place. Did you make any effort to stop her? No. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, make this accusation and it's legitimate, you got to throw the first stone. So in other words, he puts it right back on them, on the law of Moses. He's not dismissing it. He's not saying that, that people have to live perfect lives in, other, in order to prosecute justice, right? Because we wouldn't prosecute justice ever, would we? If we all had to be perfect in order to follow and to, and to uh, implement the law of the land, we'd live in chaos because nobody's perfect, are we? So Jesus is certainly not saying that. He's not saying that you have to be perfect in order to judge. What he is saying is in this particular scenario, y'all have done a whole bunch of things wrong, and you know it. And that's what Jesus would do uh, uh, it's very often. Sometimes he would argue with people. Sometimes you remember the story of, of where uh, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, came to him and they said, 
uh, if, if, a, if a woman's husband died, according to, to Jewish law, then she would be married to the man's brother, and then if he died, she'd be married to the man's brother. So they're trying to trap him. They're saying, so if, if this happens, and then the brother dies, and then the next brother dies, and the next brother dies, and the next brother dies, and she's married to each woman after every death, then in eternity, who's in the resurrection, who's, uh, whose husband will she be? And of course, Jesus, then he does kind of argue with him. He says, well, you don't really know what you're talking about, because you don't know scripture, and we're going to be as the angels because everything will be complete. There won't be any giving away in marriage. So there he's kind of, and in other places, he does debate with them. But, but more often than not, what he simply does is he puts it back to him. So for instance, you remember um, the, the wealthy young man who says, what do I have to do to be saved? And he says, well, uh, sell, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And the guy went away because he's very wealthy and money was his God. And so Jesus, Jesus basically says, you know what you got to do. You know what your God is. Um, the same thing would happen with a, um, a, a, a lawyer, a, a teacher of the law, who said, um, what's the important, most important commandment? And Jesus says, I don't know. What do you think? You're a teacher of the law. What's the law say? And then the man quotes rabbinical lib, uh, wisdom, which says, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus wasn't the first one that said that, by the way. That was, that was, that was sort of a, con, con, a condensing of the law that had been done by rabbis for hundreds of years. So the man, who's an expert in the law, says, well, that's what we're supposed to do. Love God, love our neighbors. Jesus says, well, all right, then do that. You'll be all fine. So he, he just puts it right back to him. He says, well, what do you think? And the guy says, well, this. So in other words, you know. And then, then he, the guy keeps trying to be you know, clever and say, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells the whole story of the Samaritan who did the right thing. By the way, I'm not going to call it the Good Samaritan because it's actually the worst name you could actually ever call that story. We're talking with the young people like that. And remember, Samaritans, and this is a total aside and a total freebie, um, Jewish people and Samar- Samaritan people hated each other. So they, were, they see, saw themselves as different, really, even though they were connected, different races of people. So when we actually call it the good Samaritan, the implication is the rest of the Samaritans were no, no good. This was the one that was good. It's sort of be playing like saying, well, he's a good Mexican or he's a good black person. It, it really is very offensive, and we need to stop using that term anymore because it's just not, it's not what the story's about. That's not what Jesus called the story. It's what... It's what uh, European translators have done down through the years, and they interpret this as being one good Samaritan out of most of them bad. And so we need to just sort of scrub that thing out of our language. So I'm not going to call it that anymore. I'm going to call it the Samaritan that did something nice to his brother. But anyway, so then he tells the, he tells the story of the Samaritan and, and who did well, and, and then he said, that's your, that's your brother. So in other words... With, with both those two examples, he just put it back on them. He says, well, you know what your, you know what your God is to the rich man and to the, and to the uh, teacher of the law. He says, you know what the law says. Love God, love your neighbor, right? That's not just do that. So this is what he's doing to these guys. He's actually putting it back on the law of Moses and basically saying, all right, if you don't have any sin in this, if you have no complicity in this, chuck the first stone. That's what the, that's what the law says. But he knew that they knew they had done wrong. They, they trapped the woman. They, they, they uh, dispensed justice uh, unjustly and disproportionate. They didn't try to keep her from committing the sin. And so their allegations are, and their motivations are bad. They care nothing for the woman. They only want to trap Jesus. And basically Jesus is saying, okay, you know this is, a, this is a kangaroo court, and you haven't done any of this right, so go ahead, chuck the first stone if you, if you don't think you have any culpability in it. Now, to their credit, sometimes we don't, I don't think we give the Pharisees enough credit sometimes. Now, Jesus did um, indict them as a a political religious movement. There's no doubt about that. But we know a lot of Pharisees got saved, not only in Jesus' ministry, but also in Paul's ministry. Pharisees got saved. And we tend to sort of vilify them, but for the people of that culture, they were held in very high esteem. They were the keepers of the law and order. Um, in, in our world, we might say they're the thin blue line. They're the ones that's protecting good society against evil people or something like that. Um, so, so to give them credit, they just leave one by one by one. Now, I, I kinda try, I, I'm kind of reading this through sort of a personal lens, 
And I, I kind of, am, I'm, a, I'm an optimistic person when it comes to the gospel. I, I can't imagine some of them didn't get saved through that. Because we don't get, when there were these sort of confrontations with the Pharisees, they, they either got angry. They tried, to, they tried to arrest Jesus right then. They, tried to, they would try to beat him. They tried to bring him for courts. They would, they would conspire against him. They would argue. And, but this time, they just sort of go, hmm. And one by one by one, they leave. So this is some of my interpretation, but what I think has happened is Jesus confronted them with the sin that they know they have, and he's put it back onto their law, and now they're convicted by it, and that's what then motivates it, the same way it was for the woman. So Jesus does what Jesus does. He dispenses judgment. On the one hand, is a way, there's a part that he's saying, uh, why don't you all leave this up to me? Aren't you glad Jesus is the ultimate dispenser of justice and not us? He's way better at it than we are, right? And in this scenario, he's way better than certainly I would have done or anybody would have done. In the end, he's saying, trust me with this. He's the only one that had the authority to do it. The woman technically was bound by the law of Moses, and all of the Pharisees and scribes of the law were, were, were bound by the law of Moses, which, jo- which Jesus is reminding them. Jesus is the only one that has the authority to fulfill the law, as he said he would. He said, I didn't do away with the law and the prophets. He's the only one that actually do, can do what he did. If it requires perfection to throw the stone, only Jesus can throw it, right? But the way that he dispenses justice, he does for everybody. The Pharisees, the scribes, or the teachers of the law, and this poor woman. And they all have the same reaction. They all left. And beyond that, we don't know. It reminds us that we have an obligation to look through the lens of people, through the lens of Jesus. How does he see people? And particularly people who are being treated unfairly. And this woman was certainly being treated unfairly, wasn't she? And we often come into scenarios with our rocks, ready to chuck. And there's a lot of rock chucking going on in our culture today, isn't there? There's a lot of rock chucking. And, he, and I've been as guilty as anybody ever. There's been a lot of rock chucking. But this story reminds us to check our hearts, to put down our rocks, to try to understand and see through the lens of compassion, the lens of grace, also the lens of law. Jesus doesn't stop looking at this through the lens of law, does he? But it's easier said than done. Am I right? I mean, it's easier said than done. It's, it's much easier to chuck a stone than it is to look through the lens of Jesus, isn't it? And I think imagery is important in the Bible, and sometimes we, I think we sometimes miss the imagery. Because... The question that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we drop the rocks that are so dear to us, that are formed in our religious background, our experiences, our culture of origin, our communities? I mean, these rocks have been formed in us sometimes for decades. How do we put those down? Just as it was for these Pharisees. Um, And the imagery is important because... As I said, 1,500 years before, God wrote the law of Moses, wrote God's law, the Ten Commandments. He wrote it with his finger on two tables, two tablets of stone, and gave it to to Moses. You remember the story. He went up to Mount Sinai, had this divine moment. And there's the promise made in Jeremiah 33 that God is going to give us a new new law, one that's not going to have to be taught. It's just going to be embedded in who we are. It's going to be written on our hearts and on our minds. And that's the promise of the new covenant. And I can't help but see the vivid imagery of God, the Father, writing the Ten Commandments in stone, codifying them in stone, and Jesus then fulfilling it and kneeling down and writing in the stone of the temple uh, uh, the, the temple uh, uh, outer, outer area, 
covered with dust and he's writing. And it just, we don't know what he wrote. Nobody knows what he wrote. But I can't imagine him writing, giving us an image to see 2,000 years later of him writing a new covenant on our heart. The writer of Hebrews is the one that sort of makes the connection from Jeremiah 33 and Hebrews 10 that says this is the promise of the new covenant. There is a law that supersedes all other laws. It's the law of Jesus. It's the law of love. It's to love God and to love your neighbor. I don't know if that's what he's writing. But folks, the only way we can dispense justice with without impartiality, with, with fairness, with, with, with equal uh, perspective is if we, if we recognize the law of God written on our heart. We recognize that the law of love is the most important love. And I, could, I, I don't mind saying this. There's something ugly that has crept into the church and I mean the, the Western church, but it has crept into Cross Point too. Because there are people, people who represent the church of Jesus Christ, who would stand there and say, well, she shouldn't have slept with that guy. She shouldn't have committed adultery. He shouldn't have committed the crime. He shouldn't have been drunk or high. They shouldn't have crossed the border illegally. She shouldn't have slept with that man. And the list goes on and on and on. And if that woman had stood before the church of Jesus Christ today, my conviction is there would be many who would say, stoner, because it's the law. It's what the law says. And we have placed over the law, over our law, that's, that's become the, we place that over the law of the land. Note that when we say we drop the rock, Jesus still advocated for someone who was diminished and marginalized by culture. Just because we look through the lens of Jesus doesn't mean we just say, well, can't we all just get along? Because Impartiality implies that the greater, um, the greater majority, the power majority, is the one that recognizes. So when there are people that say we just need to agree to disagree, there are some things, but not when it comes down to diminishing already marginalized people. That's when justice says, no, we can't. We can't just ignore it. We have to speak about it. I'm not saying we're going to agree on every point. I say we have an obligation according to the, according to the, 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 the example that Jesus gives us that we must advocate for people who are marginalized by culture. It's difficult... When we think about some of these things, when, when we initially talked about them, they seemed so intuitive, so simple. But everything's gotten really complicated over the last 12 years, hasn't it? Everything has gotten really, really complicated. And I preached this message, I don't know, uh, maybe 10 years, 10 or 11 years ago. And... I preach it differently because I've never preached the same message twice. But I had found this rock. And for the sake of that message, the message was again called Drop the Rock. And I dropped it. I just dropped it like that and made a big thud. And I did it for dramatic effect. And it worked. And basically the point was the same as it is today, although it's nuanced today differently. Um, it basically says... Let's, let's adopt the posture of love first. Drop the rock. Don't come in ready to huck a rock. You know what happens when you come in ready to huck a rock? Gent, you tend to huck the rock, don't you? I know, same, same is true, same with me. If I come in ready to ch chuck a rock, I'm going to probably chuck it. Best thing to do is drop the rock. I'm not going to drop it for dramatic effect. But 
somehow when we moved from that building to here, there were lots of people get, you know, gathering stage equipment up and kind of putting it all together. And somehow this rock made it over onto this stage. Some well-intentioned person thought, well, there's a rock on the stage at the downtown cross point. I suppose I'll just bring it with me and threw it in the truck. And it ended up kind of floated around back over there and over there. And it kind of floated around at places. And I think about two years ago, maybe, maybe or so, I go, well, it's stupid to have a rock on the stage. And I took it, and I had just sort of threw it into the landscape. So then, you know, then I'm thinking, I need to, we need to reboot back to some of these things. And, and I wondered, I, 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 and I remembered the rock being around. I go, and I asked Nina and Maria, I said, you guys remember that rock? They go, yeah, it should be up there on the stage somewhere. And I looked and looked and looked, and I couldn't find it. And then, as I was leaving yesterday, I remembered, I go, oh, it's sitting in the, it's sitting in the landscape. And it was, there, sure, there it was right there. I cleaned it up a little bit. It was right there. And I couldn't help but think that something was, that was so important to Crosspoint was that we're going to look to the law through the lens of love had somehow been put outside and forgotten about Something so fundamental to who we are as a people of God was put outside, and I did it. And I did it. This is a reminder to us that we don't come into situations ready to chuck rocks. We don't judge. The law of love is the supreme law. We look at people through the lens of love and grace. That's what this reminds us of. And I put it outside in the landscape. But I'm not anymore. It's going to sit right here. As long as I preach at cross point or whatever we become, there's changes coming. This rock is going to be right there. And you're going to invite friends. And they're going to come and go, why is there a rock on the stage? And you're going to say it's there to remind us that the law of love is the supreme law at Cross Point Church. And that we advocate for people that we believe are marginalized and disenfranchised. My friend Gerard, in the midst of so much of this unrest, said, Jim, we gotta, we gotta codify this. We gotta put this in writing. We need to make some statements on this. And even though this language is in all of our founding documents, it's, it's carried... It's taken on a different uh, urgency now, doesn't it? It's taken on a different sense of urgency. And we're going to do that. We're going to write some statements. But I'm starting with this rock. I'm starting with this rock, and it's going to be right here. So that we can be reminded to put our rocks down, to put our judgment down, to put all the indictment down, to allow love to be the supreme law And to see people through the lens that Jesus sees them. And we can only do it by allowing God to write the new covenant and embed it into our hearts. To embed it onto our platform and into our church. To embed it into all of our our framework. That this is who we are. So the rock stays here. And it ain't going to move. Because if it moves, I move. And I ain't moving. That's why I want to pray. We need to repent. I need to repent. Um, We need to, I have a friend of mine who every time he prays, he says, Lord, forgive us. We haven't loved you as we should, and we haven't loved one another as we should. And I'm not trying to say we need to adapt a certain sort of sociological position or something. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the law of love is the law that governs us. And it hasn't always governed me. And we need to be ensure that it does. So let's just pray. And for those of us that are online with us, pray with us. As the Holy Spirit leads you to say, Lord, we, we recognize, as my dear friend would always say, we recognize that we have not loved each other as we should. We haven't loved you as we should. The law of love has not been our most important law. It hasn't been our greatest value. 
So I pray, God, that you would write that on our hearts again, as you promised us you would. Write that on my heart, God. Write it on my heart, that there's a new law, that the closer I draw to you, the more of you is it, that, that, that is filling me. The less I become, the more you become, the more that law becomes more and more and more clear. That new covenant takes on new perspective. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me. Forgive anybody within the hearing of my words when we haven't put love first, when we haven't put you first, when we've mistreated, even amongst this congregation, people that, that we know you love and that we should have loved with the same love. You've told us a greater love has no one than, than to give uh, his life for a friend and you gave your life for us. So we know that you're our friend. We know that you love us. But sometimes we don't treat other people with that same love and that same compassion. So remind us again, God, to put down our rocks, to put down those offenses that we have, to put down judgment, to put down indictment, to lift up people who have been marginalized and harmed, to care for one another, to see people through the lens that you see them through, people that you love very much. I, c I can only imagine, Lord, the grief and the pain that it causes you when your people treat people that you love poorly. So we repent, God. I repent. And we know that you look at us through the lens of love and through the lens of grace. And you say, as you told this woman, leave your life of sin. Help us, God, to leave our life of sin. To, to search for you more powerfully. To seek you with our heart, soul, and mind and strength. To continue to knock, knowing that you'll open. As your word promises, help us to draw close to you so that you will draw close to us. So that we'll become more and more and more aware of the finger that is writing your covenant on our hearts and minds. Help us to be that church. Lord, we anticipate an emergence of something new, something wonderful, something great from all of the pain of the last nine months. Give us boldness and give us strength. Give us hope. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all, thank you for giving me this hour and 10 minutes, 10 minutes longer than I had uh, planned. God bless you all. Enjoy your Sunday.